I want to I want to start a new series, and it will you know we'll go through December, calling a calling it God's servant, the suffering Messiah, and the hope of nations, and it's it's from the perspective of the prophecies of Isaiah. Isaiah is a very interesting book. Um, how many of you ever done a study on the book of Isaiah? You you know really dug through it, yeah. So I'm going to give you some homework for December, if you so choose, if you are brave enough. Uh, read through the book of Isaiah. Now, let me give you some warning. <laughs> it's, it's complicated. It's difficult to understand. <clears throat> I will post a couple of videos in our Facebook group that uh, it, from Tim Mackey. Tim Mackey is the guy that developed uh, the Bible Project. Um, it's actually pre-Bible Project videos but it's, it's a good breakdown of the book of Isaiah. And, you know, I had a lot of thoughts in my mind and understanding about it, but, but I, he kind of broke it down even a little bit more, and it helped me put some pieces together. But if you choose to read it, if you so choose to accept this mission, <laughs> you might self-destruct in the process. But, but just know that from chapter 1, through 39 is prophecy to Israel, not necessarily for the future of the entire earth, although there is some stuff in there when it talks about the judgment. The judgments that it was talking about in Isaiah, which was written probably around five, mid-500 B.C., so, you know, we're talking 25-plus hundred years ago, and, and the, the prophecies about Christ are incredible. To go back to, in fact, a lot of, uh, you know, not to be dishonoring, but a lot of Judaism rejects the book of Isaiah because it nails the suffering Messiah aspects of Jesus being the fulfillment of these prophecies, right? I mean, it's so accurate. And we learn a lot about what happens in the atonement in chapter 52, 53, 54. But so if you do read it, and again, I'll post these videos, and, and I'm not expecting everybody to become Isaiah theologians through the Christmas holidays because I'm sure you've got other stuff to do. But if you do choose to, and I'm going to get to you know, some of the highlights, and I want to talk about why, we, why it was so important to Jesus and, and how he you know, it guided him through his ministry, the things that were written about him <laughs> from this book that he read, and it's incredible, you know, and you've all heard it. And uh, let me let me just tell you. Let me just show you, just just so you know what we're talking about. In Luke chapter four, starting in verse sixteen, this is Jesus. You know, it wasn't long after um, Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist. He'd gone into the wilderness. He'd been tempted by the enemy, and he came out of the desert. And he basically went into town and announced. The kingdom is here. All of these prophecies that have been written for generations and millennia now are fulfilled in your ears. And they wanted to kill him for it because they didn't understand. But this is what he said of himself. <clears throat> so, and he came to Nazareth. This is uh, Luke 4, 16. I, I believe this is the ESV, English Standard Version. I'm going to try to get better about citing the, the versions that I use because sometimes I forget to put that in there. People do ask, so... Pray for my memory in that. So, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, which I appreciate that, you know, it was a regular thing for Jesus to go to the temple and be a part of the services, be a part of the ministry that was happening through that old structure. Uh, you know, some say that he, he even had reached status of rabbi because even some of the Pharisees when they're speaking to him talk to him they call him teacher they call him rabbi and you know it was recognized that he was a teacher of the law the teacher of the Torah but so as was his custom uh, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and and all of history changed from this point I just want you to get a picture of this for just a minute all right so Jesus goes in here and he stands up to read. And what he's about to read, they're going to be familiar with. He actually is reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And he's reading from the perspective of the prophecy about the coming Messiah. 
that would restore the people of God, which they thought were only Israelites, but the people of God, we know now through Galatians, specifically Galatians 3, so I'll, I'll add a side note to your homework as you're reading through Isaiah, uh, also include <clears throat> at least Galatians chapter 3, because it will be important for you to know that the culmination of who he's talking about are the people of God. Not just the Hebrews, not just the Israelites, but all of the people of God, which Galatians tells us that that's the, pe the children of Abraham. And how he defines the children of Abraham is those who have placed faith in Christ, right? The true children of Abraham are those who have received salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Now, some people will hear that and accuse you of preaching what's called replacement theology, as if God has kicked out the Israelites and, and now it's the Christians that have replaced the people of God. I'm not preaching that. All I'm saying is it's a, it's a spiritual perspective of who the people of God are rather than a carnal, physical, ethnic perspective, right? So, yes, they were the chosen people in their ethnicity, in their genetic lineage on this planet, but the people of God is now a broader picture, and it's a spiritual picture that includes them, and there are still promises to those people, that ethnic group, but the bigger picture is it's a spiritual family rather than a specific genetic family, right? So you might, anybody ever heard that term, replacement theology? Yeah. I get questions about it every now and then, so it's like I'm not, you just got to have, you got to have a spiritual understanding of it. So for him to stand up and announce this, and then what he's about to do is claim of himself that it's written about him, well, let's just read that. That sounds like a good idea, right? So, and the scroll of prophet Isaiah was given to him and unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Th so this right here, the next couple of verses is what we're going to talk about throughout the rest of the Christmas season. We're going to break down the mission of the servant of God. Amen. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now I just want you to get a picture, right? Again, these people would have known the book that he's reading from. They know that it's prophecies about the Messiah. They know that the prophecies related to this Messiah are in relation to the time when God would restore Israel or restore the people of God. And the people of God were defined in that day and age as the children of Abraham. And the overall big picture of what God was trying to do was through Abraham and his offspring raise up a nation of kings and priests that he would so extravagantly bless that that group of people would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And so there's all these prophecies about the nation of Israel or God's people being restored, right? And I'm, I'm saying, I sound kind of preachy. I'm listening to myself. I'm like, calm down. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to be clear what we're talking about, right? Because the gravity of what he's doing, of, of, of what he's saying, and why they were so angry. But, but it was the, the overall big idea was that God had a people that he wanted to bless, raise them up into a holy nation, and that nation be a blessing on, to all the nations of the earth. Prophecies like God will raise them up so extravagantly bless this, his people so abundantly that the nations of the earth will be attracted to them. The nations of the earth will be drawn to the children of Israel to come and learn the ways of God, to come and understand who God is, that they would see this nation of people, this nation of kings and priests, this holy people that were so obviously blessed by God on this planet that the nations of the earth would turn toward them and come to them and to learn of God and to engage in this kingdom that God would be establishing on the earth through these people. And it was all about the idea of God's kingdom coming to earth and being established on this planet and drawing people to it. That's, what, that's what's at stake here. The time that God would restore His people, the time that God would initiate and inaugurate His kingdom on this planet. The time when 
nation would be lifted back up and no longer would be in exile and no longer face the judgment of God and a new covenant where we get new hearts, that those people have new hearts and God relates to His family in a different way because you've got to realize for hundreds of years, I mean, you know, thousands of years, they had experienced the judgment of God. They had experienced turning away to idols and worshiping other gods and depending on other nations. In fact, there's a portion in this uh, particular book before you get to chapter 40 where you hear the story of King uh, Hezekiah and he, cr he cuts covenant with Assyria, which is a bad idea. And what God's trying to do through all of Isaiah is get the nation of Israel, the people of God, to turn back to Jesus. Where'd Peter go? That's, that's what, that's what uh, you know, you got you to gotta tell him, hey, that prophecy that you gave actually. I love, I love when what, what people perceive before I preach actually verifies it. It makes me feel good. Like, okay, well, I did hear you, God. But, but it's cool to see that happen, right? Anyway, back on track. What was I saying? <laughs> that, that, yeah, that was the prophecy through Isaiah. Turn back to trust God. God is your God. Have no other gods before Him. He desires to bless you. He desires to raise you up into a holy nation. Follow His ways. Stick to His path. You can trust Him. He wants to restore you. He has mercy for you. He has forgiveness to you. You can return to this God and He will bless you. He is waiting with open... You know, all these beautiful prophecies that, my, that Isaiah gives about the, about the nation, the heart of God toward His people. And that's what Isaiah's like, look, come. But if, but if, you, if you follow off again towards these false gods and you cut covenant with these enemy nations... Then, then there's judgment. There's, there's, you know, I was, I was thinking something, but I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. But it's like, turn back to God. Turn back. That, that's the whole idea. And, and not just turn back to God, but when you get to Isaiah chapter 40, through the rest of the book, you, you start to get this picture of the servant of God. And so from then on, the language kind of flips back and forth between poetry, narrative, prophecy, and you're not really sure, and they would have been certainly confused, which they would have made it Israel-centric for themselves. But from the rest of the book of Isaiah, you start to get this back and forth of, well, is he talking about a person? Is he talking about the nation of Israel? Is he talking about the kingdom? Is he talking about judgment? Is he, you know, you're not really sure the focus of it, but, but what we now know is ultimately, especially as you learn in Galatians chapter 3, you realize that the, the servant himself changes the people of God to the degree where these prophecies about the people of God or the servant of God are kind of one and the same. In other words, God is going to restore his people God's going to restore the nation of Israel and He will use them, again, although a throwback to that Abrahamic prophecy, to be a blessing to the nations of the, people, the, nations of the earth. So you'll see that. You'll see there's a lot of back and forth and, and, it, and it's easy to get confused and you probably will get confused, but just, just recognize the overall picture of what He's talking about is He's putting His servant into the earth. And, and this is the first time that the idea of a dying, suffering Messiah is presented. Because before, they, they were expecting a conquering king. They were, you know, they, there was a little bit of pride in it. They were expecting for their nation to be set up as the, the, the nation that ruled all nations from like a, uh, a military perspective, right? And so uh, and when Paul warns about the leaven of the Herodians, uh, the Herodians, you know, the, the disciples of Herod essentially, expected the Messiah to be a conquering king. So they were kind of getting behind Herod as if God was going to bless him to the degree that he overthrew Rome and overthrew the other you know, enemy nations of God and it would be through military force. We still have the leaven of the Herodians in our mindsets today in some sects of Christianity that are believing, let's take over the nations, let's take over government, let's take over business, let's take over art, let's take over this and we will establish the kingdom as we take over everything. 
You ever heard of that? It's kind of translated into the seven mountains thing. And, and, I, and I, that's an oversimplification of what that is. And, and I don't mean to undermine because there's a lot of good stuff in that. But it's not going to be by force. It'll be by His Spirit through love, not power and authority. I mean, we do have the power and authority of God, but it's through love. Amen? There's a lot in that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of skipping over quickly that. But, but Israel would have known what these passages meant. They would have known that these passages were specifically addressing a coming king that would restore the nation of Israel. In their minds, they saw it as a military thing. And so then, so that, so they're waiting for this Messiah to come and, and they get to be top dog again. And then all, and, and, and all of these other prophecies of how closely related the Messiah is to God and then Jesus stands up and says this. You know, he says that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he's, so he's reading from Isaiah. This is Isaiah um, 61, starting in verse 1. And we're actually going to read through that in just a minute. But he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. Now, get this picture. They're sitting there. They're paying attention. They're like, oh, yeah, he's reading from Isaiah 61. <laughs> They're following along. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, again, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to go back into and really unpack these particular passages, but I just kind of want to set the stage of, of the agenda of God on the planet for a little while. So he keeps reading, and he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant, and sat... Yep, sorry. And he rolled... So Luke 4.20, and he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, just waiting, and then he says this. And he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What he was saying is, today is the day that God's servant is here to restore the nation of Israel so that you will be raised up into a holy nation. You will be kings and priests all over the planet that are a blessing to all the nations of the earth. You can now expect the nations of the earth to come to you to be taught the ways of God. And I and the servant of God that has been sent to unite heaven and earth again. I am the catalyst that will begin through whom God which will establish his kingdom on this planet. They couldn't handle it. I'm telling you, they, they ripped their clothes, you know, because that was, that was like a sign of blasphemy. They, they, they're, are you out of your mind? I mean, think about what his mom or his mom knew. But his brothers, his brothers thought he was crazy, right? I mean, think about that. Think if your brother gets up and says, the servant, because this is the language that's used in Isaiah, the servant of God is here. Is he off his meds? <laughs> you know? I mean, just, just, just to realize it, you know? So here's the problem, is that we kind of have the same expectations that they did, we're sitting here waiting for God to show up and make something happen. But when you really unpack all these prophecies, he says, listen, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when they ask him, where's your kingdom? Well, you know, it's not, it's not like what you think. It doesn't come with outward observation. You're not going to say, well, who's going to go up and bring it down or who's going to bring down and bring it up, go down and bring it up. It's in you. The kingdom of heaven is in you. And it's in you to come out of you. Now, there is a future end. You know, I don't, I don't know what the future fully looks like, but I, here's what I submit to you. We are in the time that God shared prophecies that His people would be raised up as a holy nation of kings and priests on this earth to be so blessed by God that it spilled out into overflow of blessing to the nations of the earth. 
That is where we are. That is who we are. How do we do that? Well, it's like the Holy, it's like all these prophecies. You see, do you see what happened? We started out with these prophecies and these word pictures because God knew that we were going to lower the boom on something that's impossible to believe for when we use the eyes of our head to look at the condition of the earth. We got to know it's by the Spirit. Amen? God's subtle like that. He'll prepare your heart. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, okay, I'm glad you're agreeing with me because now we're treading into the realm of impossibility. <laughs> and you're going to need to believe me and trust me through the process. I'm not saying it's all going to be duckies and rainbows, you know, from here on out because there, you know, in the world we can expect tribulation. I mean, there is death happening, you know, there is difficulty happening. And, and especially in this time of the year, you know, it's hard. I have to pull myself out of it. And I know I've been, I've been hearing from some of you guys that um, are struggling and, and people that are staying connected with us online. And, and, and we pray, you know, we pray that you're lifted up and we pray that you can turn your eyes back to him and not let the weight of the season get you down, you know. <clears throat> I'm thinking about a particular uh, lady that's up north. And she has connected with us online, and, and she's awesome. And she wouldn't mind me sharing this. I'm not going to tell you her name, but I'll share, you, share with you what she's going through. Uh, one of her brothers out west is sick in the hospital, having major complications. And um, to, to the point where he's, he's, I think he's been on a, a ventilator. I'm not sure that he's been on the ventilator, but he's, but he's in the hospital and they're having trouble placing a feeding tube because there's so much swelling that they can't get it in. So he's malnourished. He hasn't been able to eat and they haven't been able to feed him. And so what she's been able to do though, and she'll post in there and she'll write emails and she'll say, I'm, I'm so thankful that I've learned the true nature of God. I'm so thankful that I've learned what the gospel is because I can sow life and speak life into my brother. I can assure him that, you know, that uh, God is for him. And so this is what's heartbreaking about this. And, and, and these are the kinds of situations that, we, that we, we need to know who we are on this planet now as representatives of God's kingdom because of these kinds of situations so that you can bring life into these situations regardless of the outcome. So here's what's happening. She'll call out there and he can't talk on the phone, but the nurse will take his phone and lay it on his pillow for him and she'll just pray for him, and she'll pray over him and speak life. And but this is what is it's so sad because he asked her, but she couldn't understand him. She had he, you know, if you're in the room with him, you could understand. So the nurse is kind of interpreting what he's saying. It's labored speech, so she couldn't understand it over the phone. But what the nurse communicated back to her was he's asking. This guy's laying there inches away from transitioning, asking his sister, why is God doing this to me? And that's his reality. He, he is laying there believing that God is doing this to him. And no human being on this planet should have that perspective of God. Jesus paid too high of a price for the true character of God to not be known. I'm not ridiculing him. My heart breaks for him. I want him to know what Jesus did. God loves him. The reason the earth looks like it looks is because God gave it to mankind temporarily and we've destroyed it. <laughs> it looks like it does because of us, not because of what he's doing. Amen? Uh, so, you know, yes, there is an element that healing is available, but just, just helping people understand who God really is because a lot of times people will read books like Isaiah and get stuck on trying to interpret the, the judgment. And it's legit. There is judgment. However, Jesus took the judgment for all of the sin of the entire planet. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's saved. You have to then express faith in that sacrifice of Christ to receive the salvation that's offered through that. But people don't know. And it's up to us to let people know to get it out there through love. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. But the, I, I was thinking about this for this message. We are really good at studying and becoming convinced and aware of the strategies of the enemy. In other words, man, I'm telling you, 
we know why that vaccine is really out there. We know what the real agenda is about what's going on with this vaccine. We know what's going on with the government and the people that are funding this, man. I'm telling you, we study it, we found the websites. Let me tell you what's really going on. We know what the enemy's doing with this, you know, with sexuality and people's hearts and identities in this earth. We, well, I'm gonna tell you what, we really, I'm telling you, I know the strategy of the enemy is getting in the hearts and minds of our young people, thinking them think that the gender is not binary, that gender is fluid and that you can choose what it is. You know, I'm telling you, I know the enemy. I know what the enemy is doing financially and there's, there's a crash coming and you better get ready. And Man, we know all that stuff. But do we know the strategies of God? How convinced are you of the strategies of God that you do know? I'm not invalidating being aware of what's happening in the earth, right? But the strategy against anything of the enemy is love toward one another and then our united love for each other, believers, toward the world. Amen? If you ever wonder, what should I be doing? Love people. And that is the strategy of the church. Very simple. In that, as we love each other, we expect God to bless us and raise us up to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. And it might just be one person at a time that you get to be a blessing to. It's, let me just tell you, I mean, I know we're building up and you, under, you start hearing all this stuff, oh, for Isaiah, and we're going to get some understanding, and then where are we going to some deep revelation and knowledge? It ain't that deep. <laughs> it's not that complicated. God is a good God. Amen. He wants to be a blessing to the earth. He wants to do it through people. He has figured out a way to get himself inside of people to lead them and change them to be a blessing, to carry out what he wants to do on this planet, and that is be a blessing to people. Amen? So what I want to do with the rest of this message is I want to, I want to read through Isaiah 61 and a little bit of 62 because I want you to see a bigger picture of what was prophesied and what Jesus was proclaiming. When Jesus stood up to read this about himself and say, now's the time, Look at what else was presented that was to come along with the inauguration of the kingdom, right? So in other words, okay, well, God said this about the Messiah. What's going to happen? Well, here's what's going to happen. Now, as we read through this, and I kind of want you to use this as a little bit of a meditative process. I'm not, I'm not, let me, let me flip out of teacher mode and we're just going to read scripture together. You know, so, so get, the, get the picture again. Jesus has stood up. He has presented the idea, now is the time for these prophecies to be fulfilled. Now is the time for this to come to pass. What is this? What is this? What's he prophesying? What should follow? Let's read. This is Isaiah 61, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Can y'all read that, or is that too small? Okay. I was getting fancy with my graphics. I still love graphic design. It's like still a hobby for me, so I enjoy. But I want to make it readable too. But can y'all read on the back row? If you can't, you can turn around. It's actually on the back wall too. We'll pray for your neck later. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. So just, you know, we're going to read this together. Again, don't wait for me to teach you something. You, you own this yourself for just a moment. If you can, imagine Jesus standing up as the, repre as the servant of God, kind of announcing this to all the earth. Get that picture in your mind. This is Jesus speaking to the earth. This is the time. It's upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up or heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. 
to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit or the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Just say that. Say, I am an oak of righteousness. I have been planted by the Lord. That they may that he may be glorified. You know, you you are a tree planted by God. You are an oak of righteousness. God has given you a new nature in Christ. And so when I was reading through this, let me just comment for just a minute and then I'll pick back up. As we were reading through this, it doesn't say expressly that Jesus is the kingdom seed planted in the earth. But, but I want you to kind of pick up that idea, that metaphor. There's the earth in darkness, and God reaches into the soil of the earth through Christ, as Christ, and plants a seed. And that seed is kingdom. And so that seed just begins to grow in the earth. And as it grows, you know, you know how seeds grow. You see that it, there's a taproot that goes down first, Christ is that taproot that is anchored into the earth. And then there are the roots that go off, right? And then the, it, the, then it starts to go toward the soil to break through the soil. And then the leaves come up or whatever, whatever seed it is. It comes up through the soil and it takes a while to grow. And, and then ultimately it fruits and it becomes the full expression of what that seed is. I see Christ as that having been put into the darkness of the earth growing, expanding, increasing. Yes, there's, and when Jesus talks about end times, he talks about the wheat and the tares, right? When he talks about the kingdom having been planted into the earth and growing into the earth, he talks about there are still, there's an enemy. An enemy has planted weeds in the garden. But you know what? Focus on the kingdom. Focus on the wheat, right? The wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds. And that, that's just the picture that I see. So that's the imagery that this, that this gives of me. And then the other thing that I felt like God spoke to me is that Christ is that replanted tree of life. The tree of life in the garden that they, they were withheld from eating of after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and death took root in their own minds and their hearts and their bodies and, then, and, and they died so once they died, they were withheld from eating of that tree of life. And I just see, it, you know, just go with me here. I just saw Christ is that replanted tree of life. And what we are trying to do is shine so brightly because we are so blessed by God. And I'm not just talking about material. I'm talking emotionally, relationally, just the ways of God being evident in your life that becomes attractive to people, that we lead people to eat of this tree of life. The tree of life is available. That's your role. Bring people to the tree, and it's up to them of whether they'll eat of him, right? Because you yourself are... Th this, is what he, this is what he says, that they, the people of God, will be oaks of righteousness, you got to see yourself that way, not from your own effort, but because of what God has done for you and through you, and He's changed you into this so that He would be glorified. God is glorified as you experience His promises. As you allow Him to be in and through you what He wants to be, He is glorified. Amen? So let's keep going. They, so we flipped from, you know, me to they. You, do you see that? And you'll see this in Isaiah you'll see this back and forth of, is he talking about the servant? Is he talking about the people? The they is the fruition of the people that God promised to Abraham would come from him, and that is that holy nation of kings and priests. That's the they that he's talking about. But it kind of flips back and forth between, is, it, is he talking about the servant of God, the people of God? And it's all kind of one. And so it's kind of like you got to get a big picture of you ultimately see that what he's saying is he's talking about the body of Christ who is one. The body of Christ is him in this earth. Amen? Do you, are you, do you see that? 
So the body of Christ is Him in one body, but many. That, that's kind of the picture that you, that you see here. So they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former uh, devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and, and vine dresses. And there's, there's explanation of what that is. And you, but you can see how a carnal-minded person would, would read that and think, oh, well, they're going to come and serve me. As if, you know, we're kings and people will come to serve us. That, that's not really the picture that he's talking about. It's more so that we, we serve the nations of the earth. But, so, but you shall be called the priests of of the Lord. There's that language. I'm telling you, that idea took root within me a couple years ago, and, and you might remember, Glenn and I were talking about it this morning, this, this idea of the priests of the Lord. God wants a nation of priests. We are that nation of priests, the body of Christ in this earth. That is how we are to rule and reign and represent Him in this earth as servants to the nations, right? Because priests serve. Again, I'm just painting a big picture of, okay, if Jesus stood up and announced that now is the time, what's he talking about? This is what he's talking about. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. Can you, can you believe for that? Like, in other words, you're watching the news, you're studying the effects of covid you're affected by what's going on in your family. So you're, we're really good at being shaped inwardly by what's happening in our lives and the, and the circumstances of the earth. But do we also have place for this to be happening? Because this is the strategy of God in the earth right now. And it's through His people. Say, that's me. Are you with me? They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land they shall possess a double portion. They shall have an everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations. Just open your heart. Don't try to overanalyze this. Don't read this with the eyes of your head. Read it with the eyes of your heart. Don't constrict it. Just let it be there in your heart. Uh, are, do you understand that? So, and their descendants in the midst of the... So their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of all the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. Expect people to say that of you. That is someone that the Lord has blessed. And, and don't let yourself pop up into here, into your head. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, what about this? Well, why this? Well, why that? Forget about that. Let the Word bear fruit. Just, just hold it. Let it. You feel, do you feel? Good? I mean, like as I was reading, I just felt kind of a, almost an expansion. I'm not trying to get mystical. I'm just saying the Word of God is alive. Jesus stood up and prophesied. He read from this. And this is what he expected to follow along as he went about doing good and healing all. As he went about his ministry, this is the time that he was inaugurating. All who see them shall acknowledge them. They are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. 
He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts and a garden causes it what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Now don't get Calvinistic on me saying, well, then that's up to him. <laughs> he needs a willing heart and willing people, amen. We have a part, we have a role in this, and that is to believe, to not limit him, to have faith that this, he's talking about us. The thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they might have life and have, I, sorry, I just flipped to John 10, 10. <laughs> My bad. It's pretty good though, right? John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they have life and have it abundantly. The servant of God, the mission of Christ to announce the kingdom. To, to announce that now is the time that God is establishing His people in this earth to be a blessing to the nations. Amen? Amen? God desires to bless you so you can be a blessing to the nations and a testimony of His kingdom. But we're too strapped with improper understanding of who God is trying to figure out why he's making our lives difficult. That's what most of Christianity believes. God's playing around with their lives to try to teach them, teach them lessons through carnal circumstances. Did you, did you hear any of that in what, how Christ wants to work through us? Trust God and expect blessing. Amen? And be quick to be a blessing. I think if we were to look at how God sees all of this unfolding and playing out and, and, and we saw what it looked like for God to bless you and for you to be a blessing, we would probably see it and say, oh, well, that's easier than I thought. That's not some grandiose thing of me figuring out how to be super spiritual and do all these amazing things. It's one person at a time, one person at a time. And so the strategy is, as you are in front of people, expect to be a blessing. Acknowledge that God has blessed you. You know, this, this attitude and mindfulness of being thankful. You lack nothing. But, but, you know, for some people, this might be a major shift of your perspective of who God is. That's one of the things that I believe this church and I think what this gospel message spreading is called to do is change the way people see God, change the perspective of who they think God is and how He treats people, and, and translate it to this mindset. Because He's desired, and you'll see that as you read through Isaiah. If you do that, God desires for people to turn His heart, turn their hearts back to Him. So he can restore them, so he can forgive them, so he can bless them. That is the heart of our God. Amen? Amen. Now, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow. Because I'm telling you, the critics hear and they will say, well, it just sounds like you can just do whatever because everything's you're good with God. Well, that's, that's an immature rationalization of this perspective. It's, it's undermining the fact that God has changed us to be mature, responsible representatives of His kingdom. That's like it's a given. Of course it's a given that obedience and holiness and righteous behavior matters. How it happens might be different than what you think because now He's placed His Spirit in you to teach you how to live that way. He's changed you at your core so that you are now no longer a mere human prone to oppose the God and prone to sin. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. That is who you are. So living this way should be a natural outflowing of us being in unity with our God. Loving people. Amen? Trust God and expect blessing. 
Now, that doesn't mean go out and kneel down before the mailbox God, <laughs> waiting for somebody in Oregon to perceive your name and write a check to you, and then you get this check. Are you with me? You've heard those stories. If that happens, forget not your church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, and this is where I like to leave it a little bit undefined because I don't want to tell you every step. I don't know every step. I know what this looks like for me and the steps that I'm taking and trusting toward Him. But, but I think the church has done a disservice to people because we've tried to outline every little detail about how you should think about things and put everything in a bow and give you the steps. How in the world are there steps for you to live out what Jesus talked about now is the time referring to Isaiah 61. How in the world are there steps? <laughs> now, there are principles, you know, which we talked about in this last series. Keep your conscience clear before the Lord. You may need to live a repentant lifestyle before Him where you deal with your stuff. Say, I will deal with my stuff. I will not hide from God. If you find yourself in a sinful habit and a situation where you're, it's hard for you to even believe this stuff about yourself, go to Him. But, but keep in mind, God is not the cop in the sky. Repentance and confession of sin is not like turning yourself into the police. That's what a lot of people think about confession. Well, you know, I guess I got to just turn myself in. You know, time for me to deal with it. I'm going to go turn myself into the police, and I know I'm going to be punished. There's going to be judgment coming. I might have to go to jail. I might be punished, and it might not be pleasant. But I got to deal with it. I got to face up. I got to quit running from the law, go turn myself into God, face my punishment. You ever felt that way? That, that's, that is not the, the relationship that you're in with the Father. The relationship that you're in with the Father says, Oh, man, really? Again? Still, what was I thinking? I know my Father will accept me. My Father loves me, and He has the help for me. Yeah, He might have a strong word for me. He might have a word of correction for me. He might have some discipline that might need to be enacted in my life, but it's not punishment because that's already all been put on Christ for me. It's a restoration. It's a, it's a stepping back into maturity. It's a stepping back into the personal responsibility of living the way that God knows who I am. It's why Christians feel guilty, because we know better. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't feel guilty because Jesus paid for it, but if you do find yourself feeling guilty for whatever kind of choices that you've made, own it, recognize it, go to God, because what you truly are is a representative of His, of his kingdom. You're a child of God who he's trying to raise up to be a mature, fruitful representative of this kingdom that he wants to establish in this earth, to be a blessing to people, right? And, and that can be a question that you ask of yourself. Is my lifestyle, is this choice that I'm getting ready to make a blessing to people? Is this thing that I'm engaged in, is it creating a sense of awareness within me that I am a blessing to people? Or is it creating a sense of embarrassment and shame and guilt and lowering my understanding of who I am? Are you with me? Now, so there is a behavioral element to deal with in this, but it's really more about, man, I just want to have a bigger picture of what God's doing in this earth. I want to pay less attention to the strategies of the enemy, and I'm going to study the strategies of God because that is happening on this planet, and I want to participate with His kingdom not stay locked in fear and know all of the strategies of the enemy and be able to recount them easily and get angry about it. I mean, when's the last time you sought the Word of God, got a strategy of what He wants to do in the earth, and let that fire you up? Because it's easy to get fired up about transgender or socialism or whatever it is that we get mad about, right? It's easy to get mad about that stuff or emotional about it. When's the last time you allowed yourself to get emotional about what God wants to do in the earth? I challenge you. Put yourself in that state. Amen? Amen. And then recognize that it's by His Spirit. It's not by power or might. 
but trust him, yield to him, expect it, and then let him use you and be quick to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up, put our attention on the Lord. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Jesus, thank you for being obedient to the death of the cross. Thank you for showing us who the Father is, that God is good. God is merciful. He's loving. He's kind. And He desires to be that for us, and it's safe to go to Him. No matter what mistakes or problems we find ourselves in, we can go to Him for mercy, for strength, to be course-corrected and set back on the right path so that we can be a representative to this earth because God is establishing a people to be a blessing to the nations of the earth, and I am part of that nation of priests. Just acknowledge that in your heart. I belong to the nation of priests that God is raising up in this earth to be a blessing to people. I will be used by God to teach people the ways of His kingdom. And all I need to do is be open to allowing Him to bless me and each opportunity I have to be a blessing and love people and point them to Jesus so they eat of the tree of life, that is, that is my role, that is my job. And I will not shrink back from any opportunity that comes my way. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for the people that are here in, in this body today, for those that are listening, for those that we are connected with all over the planet. I, I see that uh, Cassidy's brother is back there, and it just made me think of Josh and Cassidy. So, Father, we lift them up to you. They're probably watching. They're overseas in an area that is challenging to reach people, and we just speak, we speak strength and health to them, especially as we move into the Christmas season, that, that you're with them and you see them. And, Father, we thank you that you're with George and Pastor John in Kenya who are going to the downcast and brokenhearted in a dark and difficult nation. Father, we lift them up to you. Father, thank you for all of those people that we care about that are out there carrying the gospel. Thank you that you're with them. And we yield ourselves to you to be used by you. Father, we will be generous. We will sow into ministry. We will use our finances to uplift ministry, not out of obligation, but out of generosity, out of thanksgiving because of what you've done in our hearts, and we value that, and we, we sow back into, with our money, back into ministry to support and further the gospel. Father, we thank you for all those opportunities, and we, and we thank you. We submit to you in this moment that as we transition through this Christmas season, that we will be used by you to be a blessing as you bless us, and we point people to Jesus. Amen. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity.
Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.